Well, it is I, Billy. Greeting you from across the big pond. Today there are 27 million Americans who claim to have come from Scotland. I'm so American. You can tell it by my voice. And I'm going to follow the path that their brave ancestors took. Lovely to meet you. You finally met me. <laughs> With a cast from around the world that call America home. Maggie Sam with Ultimute. Viva San Pedro. From Massachusetts to Nashville, it's 3,000 miles through 10 incredible states. On a trail to all the places you've heard of, but I've rarely ever seen. I woke up this morning with the Blue Ridge outside my window. I always wanted to see the Blue Ridge Mountains. This is a tale of families. My uncle, my dad's brother, had 22 kids. Never. Framed in unbelievable sights. So it's not real. Your, your brain won't handle it. To make an epic but rarely taken journey. Into the surprising heart of America. Perhaps we can see Murderer's Alley. Got your attention, huh? <laughs> because there never has been a better time to look at where America has come from. Or to find out where it's going next. Yes! Yeah! So what are you waiting for? Come on! I promise you, it's going to be fun. Welcome to the Big Apple, New York City. Today is the official New York Tartan Parade. A day to celebrate Scotland's great contribution to the American dream. Far, we've been traveling far. And that's me. with 30,000 other men, women and children. To America. Some have just got here, others can trace their roots back again. centuries. And they're all proud to say they come from Scotland. 33 presidents, the first man in the moon, the voice of Mickey Mouse, even Elvis Presley, all have roots in Scotland. I love this town, and it doesn't look as if I'm the only one. But I'm starting my tartan trail far from the crowds and skyscrapers of New York. By heading to the sparsely populated and quite spectacular coastline of Massachusetts. This is a great state with a lot of Scots, Irish and Italian immigrants. To the south lies Martha's Vineyard, playground to the rich and famous. It's very nice if you're into that sort of thing. But the place where I want to begin is at the beginning, or at least the place where most people think the beginning is. This is Plymouth, Massachusetts, where the Pilgrims landed in 1620. You've no doubt heard of Plymouth Rock. That's ostensibly where they, their feet landed. But these pilgrims set off for America. People are wondering why. I think they were chased out. I think people couldn't wait to see the back of them. They were boring Puritans. The pilgrims were not only boring, they weren't even the first settlers to set foot in North America. That honour goes to the Viking Leif Erikson hundreds of years earlier, and that's not the half of it. In my research, I have found a thing. I think Scots people discovered North America because there was two slaves of the Vikings called Haki and Hekia. They would sail up to the coastline and then they would send Haki and Hekia out to run up and down the beach in case there was any natives handy coming to get them with spears and bow and arrows. <laughs> if no natives came, 
they would go ashore. If natives came, they would kill Haki and Heke and they would bugger off on their Viking boats. So with them going ashore first, I think they discovered North America and they didn't even know it. So there you have it. The origins of modern America are seen through the eyes of a Scotsman. Well, this Scotsman anyway. It's a remarkable story though, that from such humble origins an entire nation flourished. Of course, that's only one way to look at it. Plymouth takes itself very seriously about the pilgrims landing there, but if they look into the pilgrims' behaviour, they've no need to be proud of it. But they were thieves. They stole the land off the Indians and they stole stuff from the Indians' graves. The Indians who had only been good to them showed them how to exist in the climate. America isn't very good at apologising. Plymouth lies at the mouth of Cape Cod and this part of the world will always be synonymous with the nearest thing the Americans have ever had to a royal family, the Kennedys. The showbiz allure of the area and the promise of a bit of the Kennedy cool has made this coast incredibly exclusive and expensive to live in. But it's not the picture postcard views or the lure of the lifestyles of the rich and famous that brings me to the small town of Mashapee. My husband's a Quinna Wampanoag. I'm Mashpee Wampanoag. Some of his ancestors are from Scotland. <laughs> That'll do me. <laughs> this is Jessie Little Doe Baird, who has kindly invited me to witness a miracle. Yes, a miracle in her local school. So, my friends, could you help us welcome our guests with our morning address that we say together? In a country of over 300 million, there are only a tiny handful of people that know these kids are speaking Wampanoag, their native tongue. What's amazing, though, is that no one has spoken this language for 150 years. Everyone thought it was dead. Everyone except Jesse. You're a fluent speaker and your daughter is fluent. So we started speaking Wampanoag to her on her birth as we had um, no babies that experienced that for six generations. Yes, that's extraordinary. Um, yeah. To bring a language back when you have no fluent speakers. Yeah, and you know what? If someone had told me in the beginning this has never been done before, I might have said, oh hell, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody told me that. Culture is such a beautiful thing. It's such an important thing. It is. You don't realise it when you're young. You don't. To how, you, how much your culture affects you and directs you and keeps you safe. People never believe me. I was in Australia and I was watching the news and they were talking about a South Pacific island. The language had died and the only speaker was a parrot. They had to take the students to listen to a parrot speaking the language. If, if I had a parrot walking around here speaking Wampanoag, I'd kill anyone <laughs> that touched him. <laughs> Jessie doesn't have a parrot, but she has something better. Children. Children who go home every night and teach their brothers and sisters, their parents and their grandparents what is rightfully theirs, their language, their culture. So this is our preschool, early childhood room. <laughs> Look at the size of the furniture. Yes. <laughs> we have one of our young friends here. Stryker, would you like to come in and meet Billy? Hi, Billy. Hello, how do you do? <laughs> My name's Atticus. Ad Atticus. Mine's like Atticus Finch. Atticus, just like Atticus Finch. That's a great name. And I'm rich. I get $2 million. Where did you get $2 million? <laughs> From, from a parade. I must come and be in your parade. Language is so important to you. It's how your father teaches you and how your mother teaches you how to live in your native language. Whether it's Scots or Gaelic or French or Italian. In their case, Mashapi. 
and it was it was a joy to visit them. Great people, great students, all doing it right. The way you'd loved school to be, the way you wished your own school was for you. Less than an hour from Mashapee is the wild Atlantic coast. From here, Scotland lies 3,000 miles to the east. And yet, throughout the 18th century, thousands of Scots men and women chose to cross the terrifying expanse on small boats. The journey would take months, and a third of the passengers never saw land. But for those that made it, the risks were worth it. This coastline was once teeming with so many whales that early settlers could hunt them right off the shoreline. Herman Melville's Moby Dick was set here and the whole area's fortunes flourished under the whaling industry. Those days are long gone, but now the whale's habitat is under threat as the oceans turn toxic. But there is hope. Perched on a little outcrop on Cape Cod sits an old paint factory. It is home to Ocean Alliance, a whale conservation group and a sprightly Scot thousands of miles from home. Hello Ian, really cool. Pleasure, pleasure. Dr Ian Kerr. The problem we've got is the oceans are downhill from everything. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So all the shit we've got in our consumer lifestyles and industry is ends up there. eventually ending up in the oceans. It's almost like the oceans are becoming our toilet. Ian is a pioneering scientist who has been studying whales for over 30 years. Most of them perched uncomfortably on the side of a boat. Without your crossbow. There's my crossbow. Can we have one of your crew start running down the road and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get a sample? I know poking whales with a big dart doesn't look very good, but it's been the only way to collect biological data from whales, until now that is. So one day, I was trying to buy up to the whale, and it wasn't going too well, the whales kept diving, and I was like, ah! And then this cloud of stinky snot came over me, and I was like, you know, as a biologist, stinky is typically good. So I'm like, you know what? I smell an idea here. Ian realised something quite brilliant. The snot shooting out of the blowhole could provide a complete health check on a whale. And to get it, he didn't need a crossbow or a speedboat. He just needed one of these. So, Chris, you're good down there? Ready? So what I'd like, Billy, if you push this forward slowly, just gently, there you go. Yeah, it looks just like perfect. All right, you just collected snot, simulated snot, but you really did. And there you have it, the most aptly named drone in the world. And then I get the dishes, I come back, I do that, put them together and send it off to the lab. When I'm flying that drone, you saw that screen. Yes. So some of the footage we get is just unbelievable. So I'm flying up there, look, there's four whales. Those are four school buses there. And look at that snot, look at it. It's like throwing... Where are you? I'm about a mile away on a little boat. And then comes in, bingo, right in the... I mean... It's a lot of snot. It couldn't be better. Yeah a biological health assessment without the animal knowing. This is a world that hardly anyone has ever seen before, and it's a breathtaking privilege to share it. To remember we all have a duty to protect it. You wouldn't see this behavior if you were in a boat. Do you know what no, I mean? Of because you wouldn't. this is an intimate behavior between a mother and a calf. We're not only collecting biological data, we're seeing things we've never seen before. Oh. I mean, look at that. Mother just hugging that calf. It's That's extraordinary. It's pretty cool, eh? 
This is Boston, Massachusetts. It's a good town. I like playing here. The people are good. We've got a great cross-section of people. There's a huge and vibrant Scots-Irish community here. And with Harvard just down the road, it comes as no surprise that some of America's greatest luminaries, like Benjamin Franklin, Sylvia Plath, and Malcolm X, have come from Boston. People have settled here since 1620. They feel kind of special here because they were such a part of history with the Boston Tea Party when the people disguised as Indians threw the tea into the river during the first strokes of the American Revolution. The city was built for and by religious Puritans. So God only knows what they would have made of the order of nuns that brings me here today. These bearded visions are just some of the thousands and counting members of the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. Formed in San Francisco at the tail end of the disco era, the Sisters are a merry gang of activists who preach tolerance and disarm people with makeup and wimples. They have orders all around the world and have raised millions of dollars for charity in the most unexpected of ways. I-26, I love dicks. <laughs> Full disclosure, I usually hate bingo, but the more fruity turns of phrases are really winning me over. G-57, I'm not going to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> How does one become a sister of perpetual indulgence? Nobody has bingo yet? No. Oh my god. Do you need voices from heaven? <laughs> <laughs> if you're hearing voices, you might not want to join. But I don't How many are there? Generally speaking, people say there's about 5,000 worldwide. Really? Yeah. Your eyelashes are remarkable. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I am Sister Angie Oplasty. I deal in matters of the heart. I break a few. I put a few back together. I like to spread joy. You do it well. Yes, and I like to spread as many things as I can that doesn't require penicillin, so... <laughs> you know, it's strange that in your lifetime it's gone from illegal oh, to, to, to extraordinary legal. acceptance and the acceptance of gay marriage, etc. We're in the middle of a revolution, I think. We are. It's G55! Bingo! Oh, my gosh! Oh. Sir Billy, how dare you? We are raising money tonight for mass quality. Tickets are one for $10, three for 20. What's your name? Christian. Christian, very nice. Oh, just barely. I know. <laughs> I love it. Would you like to be our honorary Pope for the day? Wonderful. <laughs> Pope Billy. It feels lovely. Do you get much complaint from Catholics? Occasionally. But once we explain to them we're not taking the piss out of nuns, we actually think that the work that nuns do is valuable, and we do take vows, yeah. and our vows are serious, and they're for life. They're not chastity and poverty, although... You take vows? We do. Unfortunately, chastity and poverty are the two I do best. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I always say it takes a lot of money to look like this, and after you're done, nobody wants to sleep with you. There you go. <laughs> 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 
I can't say the world needs more bingo, but it definitely needs a bit more of this. Come to the cabaret. No lawsuits. No lawsuits. We're good. They were charming people, dirty buggers. They were not above a dirty joke every two seconds. I was very happy in their company. I'm glad they exist. To the east of Boston lies a rocky outcrop of Cape Ann, stark and yet beautiful. It's the kind of place you desperately want to share and to keep to yourself all at the same time. This is Gloucester, Massachusetts, where Dr. Forster went in a shower of rain. He fell in a puddle right up to his middle and never went there again. Like all fishing towns, it has its ups and downs, and it's just recovering from a down period. They're changing the way they fish and the things they fish for. Sitting just across the water from Newfoundland, Gloucester is the oldest seaport in America, which is the reason Scottish and European fishermen flocked here. This was a land of plenty. I remember as a child seeing films about the Newfoundland banks. They said they could never be fished out, these billions of cod. So the story was that when the first settlers arrived, they could catch cod in a basket, thrown it over the side of the ship on a rope. It's a most unusual day. And they fished it, like and they fished it. Away. As At one point, they were catching halibut here as big as 220 it's pounds. Unusual day. That's a fish bigger than Muhammad Ali at his fighting best. Not a sign of a cloud passing by. Do you know who comes from here? Captain Birdseye. He was Clarence Birdseye, invented the frozen food. And the factory is now in a hotel where we live in. There is sunshine everywhere. They also have a famous greasy pole walk. It's St. Peter's Festival every summer. It's like a telegraph pole stuck out from a platform. And they grease it up and walk on it. And the champion gets to the end and lifts a flag. It's funny how international those things are. There's a greasy pole in Scotland at Irvine. It's a vertical one in Scotland, much more difficult. If you walk in that greasy pole and come down astride it, it's not such a good idea. It'll shrink your genitals before you plunge into the water for the final humiliation. What's they call going turtle here? It's some months away from St. Peter's Festival and the water is still cold enough to make a Scotsman wince. Volunteers to demonstrate the pole running had come down to just one brave soul, Joe San Filipino. I won 2007. I've been walking for, uh, I think this year will be 27 years. I started when I was uh, 15 years old. The pole's origins are murky. We know it's something to do with St. Peter and alcohol plays a big role in it. What I'm sure of is that for almost 100 years, Men have risked their lives and their life-making equipment for no other reason than the glory of the title. This is the first year that I walked. This is when the grease was real slippery, the real gear grease. On this picture, I probably grabbed the flag about, I'd say, three or four times and not ripped it down. I was cursed for a little while. And then the year after, that's when I won. I got carried on the beach. My mother was actually in the water, in tears, and that night was a pretty big part. Ma, yeah, all right, lay with the ma, just. Watch out for the crab shells, don't cut your feet. Got it, you got it, yeah, you're good. You know, it was a childhood dream. A better man than I am. Our families did it, our parents did it, you know, I want my kid to do it. It's just like a Mardi Gras of Gloucester. <laughs> Oh my 
my gum. When you just walk, the greasy pole, everybody say, Joe, go, go, go. Like right that? No. Oh my God. Yeah, I've, been, I've missed I touch it like three or four. Take. Yeah, I've touched it about four yeah. or five times. Um, More, every year, touch it. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> Wow, it's cold giant walking this year, no way. <laughs> yeah! Hey, it's all the outside. Oh, God. You gonna try it next? Exactly. Maggie Sam do Temute! Viva San Pedro! Life is tough at the best of times, but life in a fishing town is even tougher. Look at this. You gotta see this tattoo. <laughs> so all these traditions, the drinking and the bonhomie, they matter a whole lot. Which is why the locals local, the crow's nest, is so important to Gloucester. It was this kind of community spirit that Hollywood wanted to capture. My guy's out there, risking his life for a bunch of stupid fish. That's the game. When they told the tale of the Andrea Gale and her six-man crew who were lost at sea in a once-in-a-century storm in 1991, the boat! much of the film feels dated. But the sight of the boat climbing an impossibly large wave became immediately iconic. And the perfect storm is now known the world over. But for all the glamour, scale and special effects, the story was true. And for those left behind, that mustn't be forgotten. Most of the crew had ties to the crow's nest, none more so than Bobby Shatford, whose family still own and work at the bar. Yeah, he was only 30 when he died. Um, he was a good guy, typical. You know, he was, he, was, he was just a typical average, well, like the rest of us, you know, a good guy just trying to make a living, trying to get along and make a living, you know, taking away too early. So it's a hard life. It's a hard life, you know, so. We have a lot of fishermen in here right now. Thank goodness they're here, but I mean, we worry every time everybody goes out and when they come in, we keep track of everyone. And Well, hopefully the story's not just about the perfect stone boat, the Andrea Gale, it's about, you know, mm -hmm. 10,000 other people who lost their lives. <laughs> you know? yeah. So, yeah, that, that, that's the one that's concentrated on, but it, boy, this isn't, you know, hopefully it brings the attention to everybody, that, you know, all the people that that's happened to and the families that lost those people. The sea that surrounds Gloucester is a constant reminder that for all those left, thousands never returned. And for all those men, there was a widow or a child left to carry a burden that will never, can never be lifted. The scale of loss is just staggering. My final destination in Massachusetts is a place full of portent. 
a place enshrined in terrible recurring ugliness. And as if on cue, the weather is on hand to provide an appropriate touch of drama. This is Salem, famous the world over for all the wrong reasons. Welcome to the famous Salem Witch Museum. We are going to show you the witchcraft trials which took place in Salem Village in 1692. Do you believe in witches? Millions of your ancestors did. This is Proctor's Ledge. Sounds like a venereal disease. This is the site of the hanging for the witches of Salem after the trial. 20 innocent people goaded to death by fanatics in a hysterical state. Those early Puritan settlers that arrived in America, they would have known that 4,000 people in Scotland alone had been accused of being a witch. The fear of witches here and abroad was a source of the mass paranoia that made the Salem witch trials famous. Witch! 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 It just goes to show you, you have to watch out for witch hunts of all different kinds whether it's about people's colour, or religion, or sexual choices. It can lead to this, a sad event. So the law put itself at the disposal of this gathering madness. Before it was done, 19 would hang. But Salem is a good town. The trials that once defined its shame have become its strength. I put a spell on you. Witchcraft is now the fastest growing religion in America. Because you might. And Salem is its mecca. That's why they call it Witch City USA. Occult supplies. You better step to I never miss a trip to the occult shop when I'm out shopping for groceries. Here's a place where you can do black metal yoga in the morning. before you buy your magic house cleaning potions. It would appear that Salem has become the black pool of witchcraft. There's a statue to Elizabeth Montgomery, who was Samantha in Bewitched. I met her once at a party in Los Angeles. She's a friend of Elton John's. And believe it or not, this statue marks the turning point of Salem's fortunes. For centuries, the people of Salem refused to talk of their dark past. Then, in 1970... Bewitched, bewitched a nation when they used cutting-edge green screen... Ah, see you in Salem. ..to bring Samantha to the city. Oh, mother! Overnight, Salem embraced the kitsch witch and the tourists that came with her. Still popular. Which isn't to say witches aren't real. You just need to know where to find them. I like Blessed Be. Blessed Be is a greeting for everything with witches. They say it constantly. I get tired of hearing it. Everything they do, Blessed Be, you know, you know, say something else, you know. Laurie Cabot is the official witch of Salem with everything you would want a witch to have. A goblet, check. A big crystal dagger. Very heavy, hard to wield around, you know. Check. A titanium pentagram, absolutely. All we need now is some moody music. And... Come on, come on, come on. What is wrong with these people? They're slow witches. A coven of tartan-clad witches. I cast this circle to protect us from all positive and negative energies and forces that may come to do us harm. So shall it be. So shall it be. If you were hoping for nudity, frolicking nymphs, and a goat god with a big willy, you're going to be disappointed. I anoint this candle in the name of the god. Ishaba. 
because it has to be said, so far this is all reminding me of going to Mass. I draw into this blade all of the most correct and harmonious energies for our magical workings and bless these waters, the waters of life. There is a goat god with a big sausage in the window, though. So, so shall it be. What does a modern witch do? It's a lifestyle, basically. Um, not everybody runs around in robes and things. And we use our magic daily. Do people come to you to find somebody to love? Oh, constantly. They can go out there and buy my love potion and see if it works. It will attract people to you. But what happens? So will vanilla. What, vanilla? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's an old one, isn't it? Do you use it? No, I, I met a, an ice cream man who told me. <laughs> he, he, he played guitar, that's how I met him. And he said, have you ever tried vanilla to attract women? I said, no, he puts a little on his neck before he goes out. <laughs> I don't think you have a problem attracting women. Do you have a woman now? Yes, I'm oh, married. You do. How wonderful. I have five children. Oh, my word, really. You know I'm your elder. I'm 86. Yeah, I'm 76. I know. See that? I'm way ahead of you. Isn't it wonderful that we're that old? I love it. And me too. I never thought I would get here. You're a very handsome man. You know that. Well, thank you. And did your wife say so, too? Yes. I bet she does. <laughs> She's a lucky woman. Yes, she's beautiful. I bet she is. Yes, I've still got it. Were you ever scared of witches or anything like that as a No, kid? never. It's just religion. And you can have religion as slack or tight as you like. If you wonder why you get frightened in the dark. Actually, the reason you get frightened in the dark is because everything that can eat you can see in the dark. It's dead easy. And you should take your children round the house by the hand in the dark and open cupboards and let them see in. They'll get it from your hand that you're not scared and it'll last them forever. I've done it with all my children. All my children. Goodbye, Massachusetts. Hello, New York State. And as the coastline recedes and the mountains start to climb, my journey following the trail of Scottish migration is starting to feel like it's truly underway. My next stop, brace yourself, is Troy, home to a true American icon. You'll never guess who's buried here. Uncle Sam. You know the Uncle Sam with the stripy trousers and the starry jacket, and the beard and the top hat, who says Uncle Sam wants you on those recruiting posters. Well, he's buried here. His name was Sam Wilson, and he was a Scotsman. His family came from Greenock on the Clyde. And Sam had a meat packing company, 
and he got a contract for the military in the War of 1812. And he packed the meat in barrels, which was a normal thing to do then. And they put on it US, which the soldiers took to call an Uncle Sam, which is a name they had for him, Sam Wilson. So he became Uncle Sam. And eventually he became that stripy trousered guy, sweeping people off to war. But you can never put your hat on thinking there isn't a Scotsman about here. Uncle Sam wants you. All I need is a top hat. And we're off. From one American icon to another, the New York skyline. A man-made wonder and reminder that this is a land of immigrants and possibilities. And that's what attracted thousands of Scots to this city as America entered the 20th century. And in return for a dream, they built the new home into a gleaming city through architecture, commission and labour. It was Scotsmen who were responsible for Penn Station, New York Library, the Chrysler and Empire State and countless other buildings. Everything that's great about New York, about America, comes from somewhere else. And that's what brings me across the water from Manhattan. Give me your poor, your tired, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your foreign shore. Send them tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp above the golden door. You are coming to the land of the free. Freedom of religion freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. But the days of Lady Liberty's open arms were numbered. This is Ellis Island, built for one purpose, to control immigration. At the turn of the century, politicians started to claim that there was no more room and that the land of the free was no longer open to all but still they came. Ships would come full of people, immigrants. Some of them had traveled across the North Atlantic on the deck of the ship, because it was cheap. Can you imagine? Weeks on the deck of a ship, day and night. And then you come in here with your suitcase and your kids. Some of them had $40, $50 to start their new life. They were the most unimaginably courageous people. You couldn't even see the floor, just for bodies. This place absolutely full. They must have been terrified. The last test to see if they were going to get into the great America. No arrival scheduled for examination will present themselves with their documents. Find the line matching the letter on your tag. America wasn't always kind to these immigrants. It gave them horrible nicknames. A yid, a wop, a spick. I just learned from one of the crew that a wop was without papers. So they've come through all this hell. They get out there and were given more hell by the people. 40% of the American population can trace their roots back to this port. 40%. But not everybody made it off the island. We've got 5,000 to process today, so let's keep these lines moving. Keep an eye out for TB. We're getting a lot of it lately. This is the hospital. It's vast. Can you imagine? To make it to Ellis Island and then suddenly you're here for months on end with tuberculosis or pneumonia. The island was only a mile away from New York City the hardest mile of all. And disease then, at the turn of the century, was different from today. That was the days of typhoid Mary. She lived in New York. She was an Irish immigrant. She carried typhoid. She'd never got it herself. She was a carrier. She gave it to 59 people. And she was a cook. So everywhere she went, 
cooking, she was giving people the typhoid. They eventually plonked her on one of those islands in the East River for 25 years until she died. I bet there's no shortage of ghosts here. I'm addicted to those ghosty shows on television. But they're no use, you never see anybody with their head under their arm or anything like that. Or the grey lady haunting the house. There's always a wee flash of light or something. But a lot of guys saying, did you hear that? You should come here. The best view of the Statue of Liberty is from a tuberculosis ward in here. I stand over there and look in that mirror. Get down in your hunkers. Isn't that unbelievable? See, you see, I never take you anywhere. And amongst all this history, all these forgotten rooms, something truly special has happened. The hospital has been turned into a gallery, unlike any you've ever seen before. All those immigrants who came through the island, the staff that worked here, have been blown up into giant works of art. And as time goes on, the pictures will fade and peel away to become part of America, just like the people in the pictures did. The artist JR who created it said he was inspired by all the tears in the walls. I love it. This was a room for the terminally ill guys with contagious diseases. And they knew in their souls they weren't going to make it to America. And it seems really cruel. It's just outside the window. They were lying here looking at that knowing they were never going to make it. Dear me, what a shame. But all in all, it was a good story. The vast majority of the people here got cured and went on to live fruitful lives in America. But not these guys. Good night, boys. And that's the end of the tour. That'll be five bob, please. Next time, my trail takes me to the prison cell of history's most notorious gangster. Welcome to Al Capone's cell. I lay my hands on a massive organ. <sighs> and I finally cross the Mason and Dixon line into the south. Y'all have a good one. You too. Don't know that I will, but until I can plan me. Shabbat. Shabbat. Shabbat.